It's part one of our conversation with one of my favorite radio guys of all time, Jeff Woods. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Stream Music. I've been a fan of what Jeff does on radio and now on podcasts for a heck of a lot of years. I remember years ago, Arnold Schwarzenegger would say, when you walk into a room, make some noise, walk with your feet like you're a real man. Well, that's kind of the way that Jeff Woods announces. The guy's got a whiskey soaked voice and he talks from experience when he talks to all these major musicians. He's been there with them. Jeff has been a DJ across Canada for a heck of a lot of years. And I've always loved his Legends of Classic Rock series and his Records and Rockstars radio show. And now he has a podcast, which you can listen to anywhere around the world, of course, the Radio Records Podcast. We'll have links to everything that is Jeff Woods in the description of this video. In 2016, he wrote his autobiography, Radio Records and Rockstars. And before we start our interview, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out some of those rock stars he's talked to. David Bowie, R.E.M., Pearl Jam, The Stones, Eagles, Rush, Zeppelin, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, Fleetwood Mac, Ozzy Osbourne, Santana, Metallica, The Doors, ACDC, Pink Floyd, Paul Rogers, BTO, Burton Cummings, Van Halen, Aerosmith, Ringo Starr, Neil Young, Bob Seger, and Jethro Tull. Just to name a few. Part one of our conversation with the great Jeff Woods. How long is this idea been rolling in your head to write a book it's not the first thing that a broadcaster would think about necessarily but after a long career maybe i didn't want to wait until i was on my deathbed you know sometimes you wait too long i'm not ready is the usual thing or i'm not old enough or i, I i'm not confident there's so many excuses for everything in life and i thought i've got time why don't i get at it and and i had all these interviews sitting as you have in your archives talking to famous people, talking to musicians I had great uh, you know, affinity for. I thought, why not get cracking? And then, as you may or may not know, the corporation I was working closely with for a long time decided that, you know, maybe I was, you know, making too much money. That's how it works in media. As soon as you start making the kind of money you might be worth, there's a little check mark beside your name. It's usually in red. It suggests that maybe we, maybe we can get someone younger that, we can pay less to do this thing. So then when that happened, I thought, I got all the time in the world to write a book. And I had a payout from the corporation. So it wasn't like I had to go and get a real job. But there's that thing, I, I, you know, obviously in my position and yours too, we, if we get to talk to musicians who are in their recall mode of going, how can I, re can I remember all this stuff? <laughs> um, I kept a journal. I, I love the fact, by the way, let me go off track for a second. Please. You really spoke to me when you said when you would put the albums in their place in a moment of time and anyone who's a rock fan would go because that's how I remember years. I'm going, oh, yeah, uh, Boston album that year, uh, Fleetwood Mac that year. I remember years based on uh, the, the albums that were released. Was that always an idea of putting it? It just came natural because my whole life has been like yours in that regard and so many people's that love music where you will you think back and you can nail if not the day then certainly the month or the summer of or the winter of or the christmas of a year where you were doing this and listening to this so much of what i did as a kid in those years where music is absolutely everything and it kind of still is to me but you know 14 15 years old there's nothing more important than that song that you love so much on that record that you <laughs> can't imagine living without and, and I was just talking to my girlfriend the other day about California, summer of 78, being there, hearing Joe Walsh, hearing uh, Bob Welsh, hearing Bob Seeger, hearing all these records that I can look at the roadway in front of me, the, the dashboard of the car, the song in my ears, where we were going, who we were going to see. And every day in that two weeks, the first time I went to California, was attached to a song and an artist and a memory. I love it. So, so it was easy to write a book based on those memories and saying, these are the records that matter at this point in my life. I do that with people where I'm like, how did you get to do this thing? I wish I could have done this thing. And, and, but they made it look easy. I was fortunate to make it look easy because I had the opportunity to be across from Jimmy Page in New York City. And we're talking about the records that he still loves because he made them and they worked and he still has an affinity for his own records. And I had the greatest affinity because Zeppelin one came out when I was five years old on my fifth birthday. 
So I wasn't listening to Zeppelin at five. But when they hit, it was like, you know what it's like. You don't have to be there when they started. When you hear the Beatles in 2019, if you're a kid right now, they might sound like a brand new band. They, you know, if you just hear them, you don't have the visual. To hear a song like I Want You, She's So Heavy, the John Lennon song from Abbey Road, when you're, say, 12 or 13 or 14 years old, that might sound like the heaviest, coolest, most insane song you've ever heard. And then you discover, oh, my God, they've been gone. Half the Beatles are dead. But they sound like they're they're new to you when they're new to you. It doesn't matter how old the stuff is. All of my musical upbringing was that way. It didn't matter when it came out, if you connected with it emotionally. I discovered Elton John with Mad Men Across the Water. Someone came up to me and said, you know he's got Tumbleweed, right? You know he's got the debut. Even Empty Sky's a work in progress, but you know he's got that. He's got the you, live album. You, it's so funny you mentioned that. That, to me, more than any song, Mad Men Across the Water, the title song, is my favorite Elton John. That just seems so expansive and atmospheric and, and deep and emotional and unlike anything else he ever did to me. That's the song. When people hear it, they're like, who's that? It's Elton John, man. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> That's very foreboding. You know, you listen to it and you're going, what the hell's going on here? The lead in. It's 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 just so bold. And yeah, and yet it's and yet it's quiet and introspective. Elton had a way of doing that, but he wouldn't have done it without Bernie Topin. I met Bernie. Is that right? And he's quite a, a, a fine artist too. He does paintings and he shows them in Toronto at a place called List. A buddy of mine owns the gallery. So I got to talk to Bernie. And if he didn't talk about music, which he did, you'd never know that he had any connection to rock and roll because he's this great artist. He has his whole other career. Anyway, wonderful man. There That's wouldn't have been an Elton without a Bernie, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. What's the <laughs> nicest compliment you've ever received? I mean, we're we're there's that bottom feeder mentality. It's almost like the 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 the, the complex that Canadian music had. You know, in the '80s, everyone would say you'd go gold and ride the bus, an inferiority <laughs> complex. But but what's the nicest thing someone's ever told you as a broadcaster? I got I got the best compliments I think from the artists. And, and and maybe it, it's funny because... Why? Because you got it? Did the, was there a sense that you, you get it? The, the interviews went well. People always say, what was your worst interview? Who was a real... That's so rare. And they're like, why? And I go, because in the first 30 seconds or 60 seconds of meeting someone, the way I feel about it, is that you want to instill in them a belief that A, you care. That's number one. B, you know. You know something about them. C, you've heard the latest record, the reason probably that you're sitting down and talking with them, the reason they agreed to sit down and talk with you. If you don't know their new record and don't care and don't know about their past, of course they're going to be cautious. I was never that way with an artist. They could tell that I cared and knew. And so it went really well. But the compliment that I got, well, there were a few, but a couple that really stand out. John Hyatt. I love John Hyatt. And, you know, he put out the album Bring the Family with Ry Cooter and Jim Keltner and Nick Lowe. That's classic music from the 80s. So I'm sitting down with John some years later and we talk about that and we talk about his current album. We talk about his show at the Danforth Music Hall. And, and, and when, we, when he's leaving, I take him to the elevator, you know, walk the man out, thank him for the time that he's given me. He thanks me for the promotion that I'm giving him. And he goes, I know who it is that you remind me of. And I said, who? He goes, Robbie. I go, he goes, Robbie Robertson. You have this, this calm and this, 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 this tone. So I was, I was in heaven because I'd talked to Robbie before and then later too. And Robbie said to me, funnily, that was the other compliment that I remember. Robbie goes, I could do what you're doing. And that's kind of how he talks, isn't it? Yeah. I sound like you. <laughs> I said, that's what John Hyatt said. So when you can have this connection with these guys who you grew up with, I mean, it's not work, is it? It's fun. We used to call that whiskey-soaked voice. Whiskey-soaked. Well, I had a couple of whiskeys in my day. <laughs> I did quit smoking, though. And that's, I think both Robbie and John Hyatt talked about having quit smoking. Mark Knopfler too, Stevie Nicks as well, and how their voice improved so dramatically as a result. And I quit last year. Congratulations. It was you, and I, man to man, I gotta tell you, it w I was listening to you uh, on your radio show, and it, I thought to myself, but John, you're a rocker. 
you got to get you got to get out of you got to rebrand yourself but it was you that brought me back i listened to you and i i remember thinking i love always loved your voice because i don't have a radio voice i don't have that whiskey song <laughs> voice and uh so i had to rely on personality which i soon quick quickly found out there was not much but then you developed that but let me let me talk about you have a certain presence you know that that you could easily sound pretentious, but you don't. There's that thing where you're a storyteller, wow. and I found that in New Age music. Because when I was lower register, I talked softly, and I'd go, I could sound really pretentious here because I was young. See, you're at an age where you're comfortable in your skin, where a lot of announcers either can't talk about themselves because you can tell the scared ones. When you hear them on the radio, you're going, that person's not ready to talk about themselves yet. They're doing it, <laughs> but they're not ready yet. They're not in their body. Was there a point in time where you realized, well, I can kind of, they can kind of throw me in any situation. I kind of got this. Was there a, a conscious time for you? It's funny. You remind me of something. And, and I didn't feel ready at this point. But somebody heard that in my voice or in my presentation that I was. It was in Edmonton. It was on the bear. I had just gotten back into radio. I had a boss named Eric Samuels who put that station on the air in 92. And I had a really bad show one day. I had a lot of bad shows because I was just getting back into it. I'd taken a few years out of radio. And, and, I, and I said to him, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. It wasn't very good today. And he goes, the interesting thing, Jeff, about you and your show is that on your worst day, you're still better than the average. And, and it was sweet of him because it was encouraging. I don't buy it still because it was really bad. I don't think I got to a position or a point in my career where I felt really comfortable until I was about 45, which is 10 years ago. And I think that's a good thing. And still, every time I hear uh, or read a script I've written or, or listen to a show I've produced, which is a lot of shows, but I don't often listen back. I think every now and again, you have to listen. How am I doing? Do a little checkup on yourself. And if you think it's really great, you're probably not modest enough. There's always room for improvement. But I did start feeling comfortable about how I was doing it when I was about 45. And I think the key is to anything in life, if you're from the heart, sincere, you mean it, you feel it, you're doing it because you believe in it, it's going to work out all right. It's only when you're faking it, I guess, that maybe it's not going to come across as sincere. I, I wrote a, a, a really pretentious book <laughs> uh, in 1989 called What's Invisible. It came to me one day. I used to be a new age, real new age dude when I was playing the music. But I'm saying this for a reason. And I remember reading it. I thought, well, I'm not I'm not sure if it's good, you know, because you don't have perspective. You can't stay away from it. Like Paul McCartney saying, well, the Beatles were a good little band. I'm going, can you really get, per you know, when he always <laughs> says that? Well, they were a good little band. Oh, Paul. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, two years later, I went back and I read the book and it was about a relationships and music like yours. But I thought, oh, my God, I'm so self-indulgent. Oh, my God, because I was still I was, I was licking the floor with pain. I was still in it, but it was yeah. therapy and it was a journal. Now, let yeah. me ask you, when you wrote the book, and I'm glad you did, did you have reservations about mentioning her or her? Yeah, well, there was a few there were a few chapters that got uh, edited out by a couple of my editors. <laughs> And I said, well, what? there's music involved in that. And there was a relationship and there was a story. And they're like, yeah, but, you know, this one's better. Or or she doesn't deserve it. Or you are crazy. Or there's always a reason, right? That's why you have editors to tell you, give you that perspective. But uh, my wife at the time, who said, you need to finish this book. And we met in the mountains in Canmore. And I had a mountain view of the three sisters. And that's where I wrote. That's where I hammered it out for six months. She said, you need to be real honest and you need to include all the stories and you need to tell people about the times in your life that would include the relationships you were having or not having and, and, and make it interesting by virtue of the fact that life does this. <laughs> the peaks and valleys of your life all matter. Um, now, some days I'm a little embarrassed and I feel like it was, to your point, self-indulgent. So be it. It was your life. You move on. You learn. You're a different person today for those experiences. And the common thread, again, as you know, is still the music. The book is half my life in the record and radio business and half interviews with these rock stars. Some people, the funny thing is some people say, I was racing through the interviews to get to what the hell you were going to do next in your personal life, you train wreck. 
I said, well, well I guess that's a good thing because yes. if, they said, if they said, I like the interviews, but why did you have to talk about your crazy personal life? Uh, that would be a sh- book. So it turned out that it worked. I don't think you could have left that out. Well, A, being a relationship junkie and I, I've been dumped. I like the fact that you, the, the, some of the, the, the way you looked at your relationships. I don't think any guy hasn't gone through that. Whether it was conscious or not, I'm going, yeah, he's a little me. I can, I'm, I'm that guy. Yeah. Well, we were stupid. I mean, I was stupid. We were stupid. That's part of growing up, right? When you're at John Hyatt talked about how, you know, and he wrote a song or two about how when the little head takes over the thoughts of the big head, then you're going to be in trouble again and again and again and again. I think it was Harvey Keitel who said something that resonated with me greatly. Men are until they're 40, to which I appended at least because I figure I was 50. And, you know, there are good men at a younger age who somehow through through great character or DNA know what they're doing. Yeah. I have no clue. When you I've said this in the book, when you attach um, high libido, off the charts libido with uh, questionable self-esteem, add alcohol, you're a train wreck. Right. Yeah. When a girl says, would you like? To? Yes, of course, I'd like to. And then you grow up one day and you realize that you can't say yes to everyone. We'll have more from Jeff Woods coming up next week in our Radio Legends series. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our video. Remember, all links for Jeff Woods in the description of this video. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. (laughs) 